you guys the new set. Take it in. I am obsessed. I have been dying for these to be in my possession. It's crazy. A little over a month ago, I had this idea that I, I really wanted to do kind of these really funky lamp shades as the light source in the background. I had seen an inspo on Pinterest. So I was trying to find, you know, how to order that. And I don't know if it was that day or the next day, but I went to the farmer's market and I see there's a beautiful woman just sitting there. And at the time she was working on this blue. She had like the, she was sewing the blue on the lampshade. I was like, oh, I would like to purchase that please. And she was like, very well, you, you can do that. So we exchanged information and then I went on her page and just saw all of the amazing work she does. And so I asked her to do a bunch of them for me and they're finally done. And I'm just like, I'm obsessed. I just, I just want to pet them all day long. I'm so close to being finished with the vibe I'm going for. The next step is hopefully this week or next week, we're going to gut this bad boy and turn it into a little mini bar. But I'm just feeling like it's all coming together. So I hope you guys love it. If you want to go and check her out, you can go to Instagram and her Instagram is by dot Nataya, N-A-T-A-Y-A. -A. She is just as beautiful as her name is and her talent. You really should head on over there and just tell her how great she did and how good the set looks. It actually made me feel so much better that I had already filmed today's video and the audio <laughs> didn't work fully my fault because I didn't have a component plugged in, but I was feeling so deflated. And then she messaged me and was like, the lampshades are ready. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I get them and I, and I get to refilm with them. So it all worked out. If you've never been here before, this is just a whole lot of jibber jabber. That makes no sense to you. Hi, hello, welcome. I'm so glad you found me. My name is Sherilyn. And usually I say that backwards. And if you've been here a long time, you know that that just sounded off. <laughs> If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every single upload. You already know I love and I freaking appreciate you so much. So much. All right, that's an intro for you. We're gonna get right into it. Before we do, I have a quick message for you. Before we get started, I wanna give a huge thank you to our sponsor today, PDS Debt. You know, one of the reasons why I continue partnering with PDS Debt, as you guys know, I unfortunately wasn't able to use them because they are a US-based company and I'm in Canada, but the reception that you have all given me to those of you who have gone and reached out has been so positive. And every time we sponsor and partner together, it gives me an opportunity to let anybody out there who is struggling with debt know that you are not alone. I know that there are a lot of you who struggle with figuring out how you are going to pay off your debt. I personally was there for a very long time in my life. It can be really embarrassing. And not only that, it can be so stressful because it's not something that you want to share and talk about. So you're really dealing with all of that pressure internally and by yourself. And it makes things so much harder. I know what it's like to try to pay a minimum balance every single month. And you're just like, where, where's the balance? Like not moving. Why, why do we feel like we're going up? So what PDS debt has done is it has customized a 0% interest option. And this applies to anybody who's struggling with uh, credit card debt, personal loans, medical bills, or even if your debt has gone to collections. PDS debt is giving our qualified Sippendales a free debt saving assessment just for completing their 30 second debt assessment over at pdsdebt.com slash Dale. After completing this, you will receive a full breakdown of how you can save on interest every month and the quickest way to pay down your debt. One thing I really love is that PDS debt rolls in all of your payments into one low 0% interest, which I think is so important, manageable payment. So you know what you're chipping away at every single month. Everyone with over $10,000 of debt or more qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad or fair credit is accepted. Like I've said before, do your homework. Make sure this is a good fit for you because I can't speak off my personal experience. I'm going off of your positive feedback, but I still want everybody to know, do what's best for you. This is just an option that I wish I would have done so that I could have saved a lot of money in interest and fees. And I feel very confident that I would have probably paid off my debt way faster than I did. Once again, you can go and check out PDS Debt's free debt analysis just for completing their 30 second quick and easy debt assessment over at pdsdebt.com slash Dale. That's pdsdebt.com slash Dale. Thank you again so much PDS Debt for supporting the channel and sponsoring today's video. 
All right, today's case is another one where it's just the perfect fit for the channel. I know it's gonna be a case that you are all going to be as passionate about as I have become now that it has been brought to my attention. I had my girlfriend, Adrian, tag me in this case on TikTok actually. And she tagged me in a woman's story. Her name is Kaylin. Kaylin has an ASMR account. By the way, if you like ASMR, I've completely fallen in love with her. Go check her out. All of her socials are Kaylin J. Schneider. She also does makeup, skincare, beauty, fashion hauls. I totally know you're gonna fall in love with her, especially after this video. So the video I was tagged in, it was a story that she was sharing, not like her regular content, and it was about the unsettling disappearance of her mother, and it just completely ripped at my heartstrings. This is just a reminder that my mom, Tracy Linday, is a missing person. We are Alaskan native. We are Slanget, Deshitan, Raven, Beaver. My mom is MMIW, a missing and or murdered indigenous woman. Right now, we do not know what happened to her. She is just missing. The police are not helping. They never really did do much and have always said that she's probably just out there partying or whatever, which I know is not true. There is absolutely no trace of her. I need to level this up. I need to get her story on a bigger platform. I need to get this on the news. I need to get this, you know, on the biggest crime YouTuber, TikToker accounts that I can. I, I just want her name every, I, even if we don't find her or ever find out what happened to her, I just want people to know her name and know her story because like people just forgot about her. I just miss my mom and I feel like nobody is helping, like nobody cares. And I just want answers. It happened on Valentine's Day, 2019, when Kaylin's mom, a woman named Tracy Lynn Day, went missing in Juneau, Alaska. She went missing in very suspicious circumstances, but despite staggering evidence of foul play, law enforcement just keeps trying to turn a blind eye almost and kind of convince Kaylin to want to close the case. This is one of those cases where you are going to be screaming at your screen and just like air punching invisible people left, right, and center. I think where we'll start is where Tracy went missing and where Kaylin still lives. And that's in Juneau, Alaska. I had actually never heard of Juneau, Alaska before. It's a very small town. Everybody kind of knows everybody. And to get there, you really can only do that by boat or plane. That's going to be really important to circle back to later. People can't just up and leave easily without a paper trail through boat log or flight log. Now there's a couple factors that Kaylin feels is part of why her mom's case doesn't seem to be getting attention and she just kind of keeps getting pushed to the side. One of those that she's very open about is that her mom struggled with mental illness. And if you are a regular Sippendale, you know that mental health awareness is something that is extremely important to me and was a really big reason about why I wanted to bring attention to Tracy's story. I do believe that the only way to try to break the stigma is to almost have these conversations where we normalize mental illness because writing off cases like oh they had you know no mental health issues is just absolute bullshit and I'm so tired of it. So Tracy really struggled with bipolar schizophrenia. I believe there had been times in her life where she was diagnosed with having depression and anxiety and Kaylin describes her mom as growing up in a family where she felt like the black sheep of the family. She really struggled with people understanding her mental illness. And Kaylin kind of describes it as she was kind of the one that everyone blamed things on. Kaylin said she feels that there is probably some layers of generational trauma there because of residential schools. Tracy was a proud indigenous woman. I apologize. I know that I'm just going to butcher the pronunciation here. But Tracy was Klingette, Klingette, Klingette. Oh, Deshitan. Raven Beaver. And although, you know, her family is very proud of their culture and their background, what we're learning about what so many families went through and all of that 
you know, trickle effect from residential schools is just gut-wrenching. I did a video on residential schools if you want to check it out. So because of that trauma within the family that took a toll on Tracy, who was already fragile, but Caitlin says her mental health really started to present itself when Tracy was in her teens. She was assaulted in her teens and when she came forward, nobody believed her. So this really seemed to be kind of one of those pivotal points in her struggles moving forward. I had the pleasure of being able to get information directly from Kaylin, and I'm just so thankful for her vulnerability because some of these things I don't think people always want to share, but it is so important to do. And if you watch my viewer submissions, our eyes are really being open to how common this is. Women aren't being believed. And then there's just these devastating effects. It truly can change the course of somebody's life. For Tracy, this made her rebellious. She would run away. There were times that she was, I believe in group homes, her best friend wrote this beautiful tribute, reflection, confessional. Like it's just so raw and honest on her blog. I'll link it for you because I, I think it's so important to just kind of read those stories from people who directly knew who we're talking about. Amber is the friend who wrote it and you can find it at amberbatsblog.com. Amber and then bats, B-A-T-T-S blog.com. I just want to read just this one part that kind of taps into that rebellious, memorable side though. She refers to Tracy as her renegade badass from childhood and beyond best friend. One moment she explains in this writing is that Tracy was one of the strongest women that she had ever known. I had no one in my life to come kick sense into me when I was 21 and ruining my life, but she showed up and put me a little straighter, was telling me what I didn't want to hear again. She also speaks about them wanting freedom from running away from their group home on the regular. And she says, me, Tracy, and Marion sneaking onto a ferry to Haynes, a young confused firefighter and the Alkin Highway. It was a spectacular, gorgeous flight back, even if we sat in handcuffs, escorted to detention back to Juneau via a small chartered plane. And that one time when we picked the lock to the little ticketing office at the ferry terminal when we were cold, about six runaways stuffed in the tiny little building, I smile at how resourceful we were. I wanted to share that because I think it just shows how, you know, when, when somebody is labeled, oh, they have issues, they were a runaway, they were known to police. When you kind of get that back end context, it's really known for very minor things, rebellious actions that I'm sure a lot of us can relate to and just never got caught and, and got ex escorted back on a chartered plane. But she goes into saying that where is Tracy? Why has she not been found yet? And she says, because she had police problems, because she would disappear sometimes for a couple days, because she was gradually becoming more and more lost in between what was real and what was paranoia, because she would give away her last pair of gloves to someone in need, because she always wanted to do her best and not let her family down, because she tried her hardest to look for the same freedom we were always running after, because she had been my friend since we were so young, days of running from group homes and giggling, about boys because she had been by my side and I hers for so many years. Even if she had struggles with drugs and homelessness, bad men and crying children, it didn't make her less of someone to search for. Because of that, I will always be searching for Tracy. Amen. This story goes on. It's like I said, very honest about things that Amber's done in her life, her continued search for Tracy. It's just like, like I can't say enough about it, but I really just did want to share that with you because I thought that it gives insight into somebody's life that we really don't know and hearing about someone's struggles can kind of lead you to maybe assume the trouble that they got into and it usually isn't harmful or dangerous to others. You know, it's this, again, I'll use the word rebellion, the, these rebellious situations that people can get themselves into, which doesn't make anybody a bad person. In fact, Tracy is described as somebody with the biggest heart and so kind. She was a social butterfly. She always wanted to make people laugh. She would go up to strangers, I read, and, and just tell them, you know, she loved them and she hoped that they'd have a good day. And another thing that is really important to know about Tracy is she was in constant contact with her family, specifically her daughter, Caitlin. Despite having a hard life, after having children, things were seemingly going 
well for Tracy. She was a hard worker. She was determined to do well in her life, make her family proud. She was a CNA and she loved being in nursing and wanted to help people. Raising two kids, Tracy often had a second job and I believe she was working evening shifts at a place called the Pioneer Club when the kids were younger. And at the time she needed help watching them because these were evening shifts and she wasn't living close to home. So she had a neighbor that offered to watch them. It turns out that this neighbor was assaulting Kaylin. And when Tracy found this out, it really turned her world upside down. She tried to leave the situation and, and kind of get like a fresh start and, and get the kids out of that scene. They moved from Sitka to Juno, but Kaylin really felt like it was just so hard for her mom to accept and cope with what had happened to her and almost, I think, feel responsible. After this, her mental health took a turn for the worse and she even started to lean into addiction you know, anything that she could do to just numb that pain and guilt. Because of this, Kaylin and her brother went to go and live with their grandparents when she was nine years old. And Kaylin says that it was really hard for her grandparents to try to understand Tracy, which I think is very important to acknowledge because I think that it can be hard for people who are close to someone who is diagnosed with a mental illness or is going through addiction or both to really understand it, especially if they haven't themselves had to deal with either or both. You really just want the best for, for someone, especially that you love. And you're just like, can't you just, you know, stop? <laughs> and it doesn't work like that. What's really important to know though, is that despite Tracy not being the primary caregiver to the kids, Caitlin said she was an amazing mom. She was still in their life. She did the best that she could. She really loved her mom so much and, and knows that her mom loved her too, despite her struggles. It doesn't take away your ability to love and have a big heart and be a good person. Sadly though, we, we do see this a lot, that that is a misconception that if somebody has mental illness or if they are addicted to any drugs, they are labeled bad. And so when Tracy went missing on Valentine's Day, Kaylin just describes it as the perfect opportunity for an indigenous woman to disappear and no one look for her. When you hear all of the reasons why she feels like that, you are going to wholeheartedly agree. It's very infuriating. And it's just really infuriating because going through any one of these situations does not make somebody disposable. It makes them vulnerable. You know, compassion and extra attention needs to be shown. You don't cast them aside and then show predators that this is the ideal target for you because you're, you're probably gonna get away with whatever you do to them because no one's gonna look. I feel that vulnerability through addiction and mental illness is like having just like this X painted on you because it's not an accepted vulnerability. When you think of vulnerability, you think of, you know, oh, like a child is vulnerable or somebody with a disability. You know, there's this extra level of protection and care to make sure that they're okay and, and taken care of. And I just really believe that that same attention and care and compassion needs to be used for vulnerabilities that society and most importantly, authority might not understand. Instead, it's people like Tracy who are out there doing what they can to help others. Kaylin shared this one story with her mom where the two of them were downtown and they saw somebody who was cold and I, I believe they had something spilt on them and Tracy literally took the shirt and jacket off of her back and gave it to this person. She's the woman, Kaylin said, that would just show up to her house unannounced, uninvited and be like, I am here to clean your house. Not only that, but I'm gonna clean your floor with a toothbrush to make sure that it is just spick and span. Another very important detail into this story is that at the time that Tracy went missing, she was doing very well for herself. She was in recovery. She was seven months clean, which is such a big accomplishment. She had her own apartment and she was doing really well with her mental health because she was properly medicated. So the day of her disappearance, Valentine's Day, 2019, Kaylin had spoken to her mom several times during the day, which was very normal for them to do. Like I said, Tracy was very good at keeping in contact with her family. And she had mentioned to Kaylin that she was kind of having a tiff with this guy that she was hanging out with. He, I think, felt like they were very much an item, but Kaylin describes Tracy as a, a free bird and, you know, didn't want to be tied down to anybody. So they were just hanging out. 
And Kaylin refers to this guy as John Doe. So during one of their conversations, Tracy asks Kaylin if she can come by and drop her things off. Since this was the first Valentine's Day that Kaylin and her husband were spending together as like married couples, she said, you know, maybe go drop it off at grandma's house because we're going for dinner pretty soon. So Tracy said, okay. And she headed there on foot. She didn't drive. When she got there, she dropped off her things and she wasn't really dressed for the weather. Her family just assumed that it was because she gave her jacket to somebody because this is something that she did often. Like I said, she was always giving and looking out for other people. So her sister gave her some snow pants and a jacket to keep her warm and she dropped her off downtown. And around this time, Tracy again called Kaylin just to check in and let her know that she was headed towards John Doe's boat towards the marina. He he had a boat that he lived on in the marina. Looking back, Kaylin thought there were some things that seemed odd, but they didn't think of it like that at the time. And one was that she had dropped off all of her things and was going without them because that was not like Tracy at all. Kaylin shares that they lovingly refer to her as the bag lady because she will just walk around with her bags and her possessions with her. And, you know, due to her mental illness, she was extra paranoid and she didn't want people stealing her things or anything to go missing. So she always had them on her. So it was odd that she dropped them off and that they didn't know why. Another thing that Kaylin reflects back on is that during that last conversation, she said to Kaylin that she was thinking that somebody was following her and that someone wanted to to hurt her or kill her. And Kaylin said that there have been a lot of times in Tracy's life where she's felt like that and that is a large part of her heightened paranoia. And so she just, you know, made her feel better. Like everything's going to be okay. I'll talk to you in a little bit here. We're going to dinner. They hung up with each other. And that was the last time that Kaylin ever spoke to her mom. The last time she was seen by somebody is it's kind of unknown because there are a lot of people who have called and said, oh, she was here or there. But the last time that family had heard from her was Kaylin. And that was around 1 p.m. And she knew that she was headed towards John Doe's house. Or boat, sorry. The next day, when Kaylin realizes that she never heard from her mom again that evening, and that she now still hadn't heard from her the following day, instantly she feels like something's not right. And she heads over to her grandparents' house and says, you know, I really think something's wrong. Now, maybe there's an element of her family just not wanting to go there and, you know, think the worst. But Kaylin said that no one believed her, wasn't really taking it seriously. They kind of told her, uh, you know, maybe she's, maybe she's relapsed, maybe she's partying and we'll hear from her soon. She'll, she'll come back. Which Kaylin openly describes as something, you know, to this day that is still really hard to process. From the get-go, she felt like something was wrong and it's almost like she wasn't being heard or those feelings weren't being validated. And not just by family, but also by police as well. So right from the beginning, Kaylin's the one who started taking things into her own hands. She hit the streets. She drove everywhere she could think of looking for her mom. When she can't find her, she goes to the police station and basically like insists that a missing persons report gets written up. She later finds out that this was not even submitted until weeks later and feels that the only reason why it was even even submitted was because she had reached out to the local news station and the news station called the investigators to say, hey, we're going to run a story, you know, just giving you the heads up. Do you have anything to add? And then they were like, oh, well, we should probably file this because if they look into it, we haven't even submitted this into a database that Tracy's missing. And that's kind of how this whole entire investigation has gone. It's been Kaylin following up and finding out that nothing is getting done, even though she is being led to believe that it is. She's the one who is calling the police right from the start saying, you know, have you, have you asked so-and-so what they heard? I'm hearing a lot of rumors. Have you looked in her bank account? Have you pulled her phone records? None of which was done. In fact, she was actually told by one of the investigators to call the phone company herself to get the records. And the person on the other line, you know, that worked for the phone company was like, we can't do that. Like they know like they have to be the ones to request this. So almost as soon as they acknowledge that Tracy is in fact missing, they then call Kaylin and say, oh, you know, no, she's alive and well. She was seen at Fred Myers by somebody and she's described as happy, healthy, and safe. Kaylin's like, okay, that's great. 
you know, if it's at Fred Myers, there has to be some form of evidence like surveillance or something like that. Can you show that to me? And they're like, oh, well, no, we, we don't have anything like that. We just, we just trust that the witness knows that it, it was your mom. And they wanted to close the case. They're saying that she's alive and well. And Kaylin said, absolutely not. So they keep it as a missing person's case and a little bit of time goes by and then she's contacted by the investigator again. This time he says that a clerk at a convenience store reached out to them to say that they saw Tracy in their store and she was buying some smokes. This sighting I guess was not in Juneau, it was in a town close by called Wrangell. Again, the description of Tracy is pretty much verbatim. Kaylin said she was happy, healthy, and safe. They want to get her permission to, you know, close the case, move on. And Kaylin's like, I, I need surveillance. I need to see that it's my mom. I can't just take somebody's word for it. This time they're like, nope, we don't have any surveillance or photos, but we really trust this person. You know, they were really certain that it was Tracy. So we can't really do much, but go with their faith that they saw her. And so Kaylin hangs up and she's decided she's going to call this clerk herself. So she calls this guy and she said that he was almost annoyed. He was like, they keep reaching out to me, pretty much telling me that I have seen her when I have not. And I'm like, I have not seen her. And they keep asking, well, how do you know? You know, like, have you seen someone who kind of fits this description? And he's like, I'm, I'm sure I do. Like, it's a very vague description. A lot of people are, you know, 5'5 five, five with bangs and, you know, darker blonde hair. But just looking at this photo, like, I am certain that I know that she has not been in this store. And they're kind of trying to tell him that, well, you know, like maybe she could have been. And he even says that I actually do have surveillance from the day that they're trying to say that she was in here and sent it and there she was not. So this made her want to follow up with that first tip from Fred Meyer. And sure enough, she calls there and none of the staff ever reported that Tracy was seen by either them or customers. So she lets some time go to see if the investigators are going to call and be like, oh, we, you know, we made a mistake. It wasn't her. But she hears nothing. So she calls and kind of puts them on the spot. And then at that point, the investigator was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it wasn't her. You know, meanwhile, she she's reflecting back on this stuff and, and thinks, had I not called, and if I didn't call them to kind of let them know that I know she was not seen and I just took their word for it, they want to just close this case. And that does keep getting pushed. It's like a few days after this sighting from the clerk that she finds out is not true. She gets this photo sent to her from one of the investigators and it's very grainy and it's taking at an extremely far distance. Like you can barely make out the person, but you can see that it's a woman and she's at a gas station. She's pumping gas. So they ask Kaylin if this can be her mom. And even though it's far away, you know, when you know what your family member, like especially your mother and, and a daughter, you've got that certain bond. I know that I would be able to identify my mom in a far picture just by her posture. You know, you've got like a, this, there's a certain posture to us all. And just off of that, she looks at it and says, no, that's not my mom. And kind of like, how the clerk described it she's being told like well how do you know it's not a very clear picture it could be your mom and she said well I know my mom you know I could pick her out of a hundred grainy photos but she ultimately ends up being able to shut it down by being like you know yeah you're right it's not the clearest picture but this woman is driving and pumping gas my mom does not have a license she doesn't drive so it's at this point that Kaylin started to turn to social media to raise awareness for what was going on and, and to spread the word. Now we have seen that doing something like this can be very beneficial for families, getting it out there on a large platform and bringing more attention and putting that pressure on to proper authorities. But it can also bring a lot of people, sick people out of the woodworks who want to spread misinformation and who want to sickly torture the family. It's something I'll never understand. I, I can't stand people behind a keyboard who just say what they want with no thought of like those repercussions of the person on the other side having a heart and soul and feelings, especially in these vulnerable times. I mean, Kaylin is putting out what potentially could be the biggest tragedy in her life and just seeking help. And people would, would just go on the post and be like, oh, you know, her mom's an addict. She's probably in treatment or she probably ran away 
day. She's probably on a binge. A lot of people said that they saw her at certain stores. So she's trying to even follow up with leads that she didn't really believe, especially like the, the treatment because she thinks, all right, if she's in treatment, she would have called me. Every lead that was coming was never able to be confirmed. Some of the stories that Kaylin shared about messages that she got just, oh my gosh, I you know, air punches. There were thousands of people who reached out and people who were saying that they knew somebody who had killed Tracy. There were stories of them being witness to Tracy's murder and seeing her cut and put in a garbage. Just heartbreaking. Again, too, because it's never been able to be proven. Like I get, I just can't imagine reading that stuff or being called and contacted and told this stuff and like crying on the other line because you think that this person is being honest and that this happened to your loved one and it turns out it's not true. Now, one thing that had been reoccurring in tips though was that there were multiple witnesses that saw Tracy and John Doe arguing on that Valentine's Day. So Kaylin's cousin actually knows John and reached out to John John and recorded the conversation. You can actually hear snippets of this conversation on the Innocent Until Tipsy podcast. I'm going to include that clip there, but if you want to go see the full interview with those ladies and with Kaylin, that's on YouTube. I'll also link that too for you. So it's nice and easy. Like I said, I really love when you're able to hear from Kaylin directly. So basically on this portion of the call, I believe it was over an hour long, but he's explaining to Kaylin's cousin that yes, they had seen each other on Valentine's Day. Yes, they argued. And something that they did when they argued was they used these boat oars to like battle each other. They would hit each other with these boat oars and it was supposed to be something that was like very healthy to kind of get out that aggression instead of like using your fist. They use these boat oars to kind of like spar each other or something like javelin style. And it's really unsettling hearing him talk about this. He admits that he got Tracy pretty good in the head. I think he says that she, you know, fell or was cut or something like that. But also the way that he belittles and laughs about Tracy thinking that she was like really tough when she really wasn't and he really got her good. It made me freaking sick. I'm going to play this here for you guys now so that you can know what I'm talking about. She slipped between the boats. She was in one sleeping overnight for days in one boat alternating between heroin and up and um and uh she went to climb off the boat, slipped between the boats, and fell down and, and, and gashed her leg on a wheel, on a fender, went bent a fender on a boat trailer. But she didn't want to tell anybody. And, uh, what's her name, her, her twin sister, um, that was Angie. Long, that was a long time ago. Are you talking about Tim? Angie went out there and, and to look for her and talk to her and saw this wound and called me and I went out and got her and took her to the ER. Right, right. That was a long time ago. So, um, yeah, it was. So I, I just heard about, I heard about a fight you guys had on Valentine's Day or some around that time or something like that. What, why? Um, that's what the cops said too, but I don't have any memory of it. We had fights all the time, but we settled them. Okay. There's, there's two, three foot long, perfectly identical, uh, oak sticks that come out of rubber boat, Zodiac. No, I'm talking about Valentine. You, did, did Tracy yeah. trash your boat or something like no. that? No. No. What I'm saying is every time she got all slappy and shit because she's too stupid drunk, I would get out there sticks and we'd step out on the dock and we'd spar with them. And uh, sometimes we'd knock each other in the head pretty fucking hard. And I remember one time, and I think this is the Valentine's Day incident, she woke up the next day with a big lump on the side of her head and I wouldn't tell her how it got there. And um, I just laugh because uh, she was never as good as she thought she was <laughs> with a stick. <laughs> and, um, and I'm a little quicker. And it's a, it's a fun fun game we'd play and um, a little bit dangerous, but we always work hard to not hurt each other. So, you know, the name of the game was to, you know, um, establish a tap. After hearing this, Kaylin sends the tape to police and months go by and she hears nothing. Nothing from the police, actually. John is talking a lot, though. He's all over social media 
talking about how he saw her that day, talking about these oars, this oar situation. But then he also says that it's very likely that if the police were ever to do a search on his boat, that they would find her blood everywhere because Tracy would, you know, menstruate on the boat and it would just be splattered all over the walls. This is what he said, which made me think of the Jessica Grady case and just A, how uneducated men can be when it comes to a woman's cycle. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't splatter all over the walls. Not only that though, but he was also saying to other people who were coming forward that he admitted that he killed her and that he put her in a crab pot, which is like a crab trap and told these people, you know, she was never going to be found. It's Kaylin again, who has to follow up and be like, what, what's going on with this guy? And she's told, oh yeah, we went to talk to him, but he said he didn't see her that day. So we left. And he had been changing this story a lot whenever he was questioned. Sometimes you were able to see that on social media where he would be like, oh, actually, I, I don't think that it was that Valentine's Day that I saw her. I think it was the this this boat or incident happened the Valentine's Day before, like a year ago. And Kim was like, okay, well, whatever. Did you find anything on his boat? He's telling people that you're going to find her blood on there. And they're like, oh, well, we didn't check. And as soon as he you know, was questioned by police, questioned by police and knew that some attention was on him. He sold his boat. I can't even imagine, you know, that feeling for Kaylin. And again, like more time passes between this stuff and it's her that is sitting there trying to understand why she's seeing something that they aren't. So she calls back and speaks to an investigator and says, you know, I'm just really not understanding this. These are his own words on Facebook. This is his own voice and words saying that he did see my mother that day, that they did argue, that you're going to find his blood. You know, why is this not being taken seriously? Especially all of that, you know, damning admissions on this tape and the investigator that she talks to is like what tape they didn't have a tape so when he looked into her evidence locker there was nothing in tracy's file like blood boiling but she pushes on i don't know how she does it again tips just keep coming into her as she's you know doing the best that she can to raise awareness on her social media platforms and she gets another message from somebody you know pointing towards John Doe and it's this woman who said that after Tracy had disappeared there was a few people and herself partying on John's boat and she got a little bit chilly and he brings her this bluey green jacket to wear so she leaves the boat and she's still wearing the jacket and you know, a few days later or whatever, cleans up the jacket, you know, washes the jacket so that she can return it back to John in nice form. She said after she washed the jacket, she realized this was the coat that she had seen Tracy wearing in some missing person flyers, I believe. So Kaylin finds this out and she's just like devastated that, you know, the jacket is now washed and there could have been evidence on it, but she calls the investigators to go to this woman's house and pick it up and just check it in case you know sometime later she's contacted said that they tested the jacket and there wasn't much that they could do because there wasn't anything incriminating they didn't find any blood or anything like that like dna tying tracy to this jacket this jacket also in future talks with investigators kaylin finds out seems to be something that is now also missing she's even requested you know just some type of log to to know what is still in evidence, you know, what is being shared with other investigators who keep coming on and off of this case. And to this day, she does not have any record of what she's submitted. And so I I can understand if somebody didn't, you know, if if investigators didn't want to share things that they have found and that they're kind of keeping close to them so that it doesn't get out there. But these are things that Kaylin has provided and knows about and, Anytime she talks to somebody, they have no idea what she's talking about. And she just wants to know if those items are still in evidence. And she doesn't know. About a year into the search for Tracy, Kaylin gets pregnant, which is a miracle. After trying for years with her husband to have a baby and being told that she never would, it was actually Tracy that told her that she would have a baby one day. In fact, Tracy had lost a baby that she found out was 
supposed to be a boy and as her and Caitlin were talking about it and kind of like mourning that loss Tracy said you know I'm okay with this because I know he's gonna come back and he's gonna be born to you so this pregnancy was super important big miracle moment for Caitlin especially because she actually didn't realize that when Tracy first went missing she was pregnant and when she found out that she was pregnant she was just like dealing with all of the stress of everything that was going on looking for her mom she lost that baby so she thought that that was like her one opportunity opportunity to have a baby and now she lost it so it was very crucial that she did the best that she could to have a very calm and healthy pregnancy pretty early on in the pregnancy she did experience some complications so she was put on strict bed rest which obviously made it impossible for her to continue being the one who's going out driving anywhere that she can imagine just keeping on the streets spreading you know the word about her mom missing and looking for her mom so she's kind of leaving it into the investigator's hands and feels like okay maybe that was you know that this is an okay decision decision because she gets a phone call from the police and they say that this guy had recently contacted them. He had just purchased a house that was, you know, on top of this mountain and it was on the path that would have been from like where Tracy was last seen going towards John Doe's house. And so this guy bought this property and it was like his first day there. The dog was out running and all of a sudden the dog comes back with like a piece of woman's clothing and he's very frantic. He wants his owner to follow him back to where he just came from. So this guy follows him and he leads him to this like bush and under the bush there's women's clothes that are neatly folded and tucked away and inside is an ID and it's Tracy's ID and these are Tracy's clothes that she was last seen in. So finally she is told that they are going to search the area for Tracy and keep in mind this is like a year after Tracy I think it was a year to the day maybe that Tracy had gone missing and this was the first search that was going to be done for her not long after she gets a call that they retrieved the clothes but that was pretty much all that they could do I guess around this time of year the terrain there was really rough and it was really dangerous to try to do a real thorough search. But I mean, Kayla, this is the first time that Kaylin feels that she's been heard and the ha they have something, you know, tangible that is tied to Tracy. So she just begs them not to give up yet. And they did hire, I think that it was like a hiking expert, somebody who was very experienced with that rough terrain to join in the search. So they move further up the mountain or I guess further down the mountain. Kaylin has said that it was like equal elevation from where the clothes were found, but just further down. And they find this almost looks like a makeshift grave. And they send a photo to Kaylin and it's like this cross. And on the cross, there's this earring. And they ask Kaylin if it's her mom's or, you know, maybe hers that her mom borrowed. And Kaylin doesn't recognize it as being hers and she doesn't recognize it as being her mom's. But she's like, but that doesn't mean it's not. Like we've talked about before, Tracy loved things. She collected a lot of things. She always had them in her bag. So she's like, I, you know, sh someone could have gifted those to her. She could have just recently bought them. I, I don't know. But since Kaylin did not give a 100% confirmation that it was Tracy, they told her they weren't going to continue on with the search, which is just mind boggling to me. And Kaylin too, she says, well, that makes no sense. You know, you've got this grave area or this cross on this grave area and it looks like the ground is not level. It looks like it's been disturbed. There's like a tarp in the background. And Kaylin says, you know, just because I can't identify this one earring as 100% being hers. And I just want to be truthful because I don't want you to ever feel like I've lied or misled you to look for, for her when it, I don't know if it's hers. But what if that's somebody else's and that area right there has somebody else? Like who else is missing in that area that we need to bring home and you're not doing that? Kaylin even says that she was sent a photo from investigators with a cadaver dog who's like sitting on the spot by this homemade cross and it's sitting right on the pile and usually that's where they'll like stop and alert to like this is the area and she brings that up and they said oh we just asked him to sit there and pose for the photo they just keep telling Kaylin there's nothing for them to dig up I mean I feel like you don't know that unless you dig it up and they didn't and they really tried to push that because of like how rough that area and that location of where her clothes were initially found. There was this, you know, steep embankment where it was almost like a cliff that you just like 
if someone fell, you probably wouldn't make it. They want Kaylin to believe that Tracy probably was experiencing hypothermia, feeling really hot, undressed, got fully nude, folded her clothes, put them under this bush, and then jumped off the cliff to take her life. Which I also think is very important to bring up when you're tying cases with mental illness. Mental illness does not always equal suicide. Like, I don't know where that comes into play. It's really frustrating. And Caitlin said that. She's like, it, my mom wouldn't do that. I know my mom. It's almost like they're just trying to explain this person that she knows isn't her mom and, and just to believe it, to let it go. So when she found out that they weren't going to search the area or like do a dig in this area, she asked the investigators if she could know where it was, not for herself personally to go to, but she would hire, you know, a private investigator, professionals to go and search on her dime. They said they absolutely will not do that. They don't want her going out there, which I could understand if they believed that this was an act of crime scene, an area that they wanted to search, but they have specifically told her that there's nothing there to look for. So why wouldn't you tell her where it is if you're done with the area? When Kaylin found out about the clothing found, she specifically made a decision not to share that on social media, even though she had been sharing a lot you know, throughout her mom's case. And she kind of wanted to keep that to herself, like investigators do too, to see if anything would come up. Sure enough, she sees this comment from John Doe and he's having this conversation and he's saying that he was in the area by where Tracy's mom lived, where she had dropped off all of her belongings. And he was going for a walk in that area one day and came across a scene that looked like a woman had been attacked and her clothes were left behind. And he just straight up says on there, like, I think that's where Tracy is. So Kaylin, along with multiple other people, send screenshots of this to the investigators. And they tell her they already looked into it. But the area that John was referring to, it turned out to be what they believed was a homeless man's clothing and items. Which is odd, because even John himself said that it was women's clothing. And he knows Tracy's clothing, like what she would have been wearing. Now, this part is where there is speculation that maybe John doesn't have anything to do with this. And it could be someone else. Even though early on in the investigation, Kaylin had been told by multiple investigators that all of the flight and boat records had been pulled and there was nothing on there leading to Tracy, nothing with her name, no credit cards, nothing like that. All of a sudden, those were wanting to be looked at again. And I guess this was a tip from an investigator that was about to retire. And he wasn't on the case, although he has contacted Kaylin and made it almost like, I'm not going to speak for her and say like threatening, but clear that he feels like she should stop talking about the Juno Police Department on social media. So this guy is about to retire and reaches out to a buddy of his that is on Tracy's case. And he says, I know you've already looked at the flight and boat records, but you know, maybe, maybe you just want to check them again. And so he does. And sure enough, they call Kaylin and they say, oh, there's a record of your mom leaving Alaska. Allegedly, she left Alaska by plane and this flight took off from Anchorage. Then it had her stopping in Seattle and then Kalamazoo. And this had her leaving in June, which meant that like from February to June, we're supposed to believe that Tracy just didn't want to talk to her family, even though she's never, ever, ever done that before. So Kaylin's like, okay, well, that's odd because my mom doesn't even have a passport. Like surely she would have needed some form of identification and you found her ID in her clothes. So how would she have gotten on the plane? Second, how did she get to Anchorage? If you look on the map, they're nowhere near each other and she didn't drive. It really didn't make sense to her, especially cause she's like, my mom doesn't even have a credit card. Like how did she book this flight? There needs to be a paper trail. So Kaylin goes and takes it into her own hands. Like she knows she has to, and she calls the airline. And sure enough, there's no record of Tracy flying. The flight representative actually even said that that schedule on that day didn't even exist. Like there was nothing from Anchorage to Seattle and then to Kalamazoo. So again, Kaylin calls the investigator back and she's like, it wasn't my mom. And he's like, oh yeah, I forgot to correct myself. We did look into it and it was a different Tracy day. They spelt their name 
with an I instead of a Y and go figure their birthdays were pretty much identical just one day off. Like when I'm, oh, 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 oh. for legal purposes, that is not a threat of any sorts. It's just me fist bumping myself. Like it just, it's just infuriating to me how, how somebody would expect, you know, a missing person's family member, their daughter, you know, Tracy's daughter, Kaylin, to believe this when she's already been following up with everything and calling you on your crap. You just wanted her to believe, you know, the last time you talked that she took her clothes off and jumped off of the side of the mountain. And now you want her to believe that she left in June to go and fly and just leave her family and never talk to them again without ID, without a credit card. And then when you're called on it, you're like, oh yeah, this is another Tracy day. Even though everybody in the town like knows each other and it was not another Tracy Lynn day with the same birthday. Oh, I'm freaking vexed right now. From here, Kaylin says that there is like a huge amount of time that goes by and nothing's really happened. You know, she's a new mom, just so everybody knows she had a little boy, which is just like, can't even imagine what that moment would have been like to find out that you've got this little boy and your mom, you know, told you you were going to. So Kaylin is still, you know, doing everything she can to keep people posted on social media. But you know, to be honest, like being a first time mom to a little baby, that's also really taxing. So she hadn't really been able to follow up as much as she would have liked. And one day she's at the grocery store, she's shopping and this woman approaches her and starts apologizing and says she's really sorry that she never contacted Kaylin sooner, but she knows what happened to her mom. This woman tells Kaylin she knows that Tracy was murdered, but it was not by John Doe. She said it was the police and she witnessed it. This woman says that she was downtown and Tracy was downtown on that Valentine's Day and she saw Tracy dancing and singing and the police approached her and told her to stop and that she was causing a scene, which led to, I guess, an argument between them. This woman said that in the middle of the argument, she saw an officer take out his baton, repeatedly strike Tracy and hit her in the head so hard that she just like fell. And the way she fell and didn't move, she said she knew she was gone. And all of a sudden she sees this look of panic over this officer's face and him and his partner picked her up and put her in the back of the police car. Now, this woman also says that she had told Kaylin's grandmother, Tracy's mom and Kaylin's aunt, Tracy's sister about this and actually had lunch with them to tell them the story. But she heard that not long after that lunch, Tracy's mom, Kaylin's grandma had passed away. And when she found that out, she was terrified and left town, which is true. So around the time of when they were searching for Tracy on the mountain, Caitlin was notified that her grandmother passed. I just, the loss is just, it's, it's devastating. Keep in mind, she's also on bed rest, you know, trying to keep this baby keep this pregnancy. Now, Kaylin says there's no evidence or proof or accusations coming from her at all that there was any foul play whatsoever. She doesn't even know who or what to believe with the amount of things and people that have come forward at this point. But she did say that her grandmother passed away tragically. She had COPD and emphysema and it appeared to them that she was in her bathroom and she was having some form of you know, maybe coughing fit, couldn't breathe, and that she must have lost consciousness and hit her head on, I believe, the counter or maybe the bathtub and broke her neck. So without pointing the finger or anything like that, Kaylin just comes forward with this statement. This woman didn't want to be a witness and go herself. She's scared. So Kaylin went and said that this is what she heard. And again, she's just told that it was investigated and that it didn't lead anywhere. Something I think that is really important to also mention is that going back to John Doe, John Doe's family has been in contact with Kaylin multiple times and they have said to her that they believe that he is involved in some capacity. They've shared stories with her just about the type of person that he was. And it really shows like a very sick and twisted, deranged person. One story that they told her was during his divorce, there was an argument between him and his soon to be ex-wife. And he was so angry at her that he took their dogs out to the backyard. He unalived them with a gun and then took photos and sent it to his wife, his soon to be ex-wife. Another family member told her about a time when it was the first time he was gonna meet his wife's 
parents, like his soon to be in-laws and they all met up on his boat and there was some form of argument that happened. And he took them out to this area that kind of had like a, this like island and wanted to leave them there like with no cell phone nothing and and strand them no one would have known where they were luckily they were able to talk him out of it but it just kind of shows the deranged capabilities of this guy now the unfortunate thing that is had if it was him we will never know from him directly in terms of a confession or where tracy is or why she is no longer here because he's recently passed away which is just going to make you know this already extremely difficult investigation even that much harder to get answers at the end of the day though i mean like really the pressure needs to be put on the police department it's really frustrating that basically his own admissions were never thoroughly investigated like when he was alive or his boat was never searched before he sold it you know why is caitlin the one who is acting as an investigator this is not her job a large speculation is that John was a police informant. He bragged a lot around town that he was untouchable and a lot of people knew that he was a known dealer and that allegedly the police knew and that just wouldn't do anything about it. So that's another theory as to why he was never properly searched or investigated. Kaylin has actually tried to reach out to the FBI to see if they can kind of take over. And she's been told that they can't get involved unless the investigating officers escalate it and, you know, like request assistance on the case, which does not look like that would be something they would want to do because they keep trying to make her feel like her mom is okay and that just she doesn't want to be found. I mean, it's not even subtle that the investigating officers really don't care and want to make this whole situation go away. Kaylin shared this one story that was <laughs> air punch. She told a story where she was speaking to one of these investigators and said to him, I can't stop. I can't just close this without, you know, proper proof. What would you do if it was your mom? And this... <laughs> straight up says to Kaylin, my mom would never be in this situation. My mom doesn't even drink. She's not an alcoholic. <gasps> Sir. What? Like what the, how is that okay? The whole thing is just so infuriating because it's so obvious what's happening here. Right now, what Kaylin really needs from us is support and to help amplify her voice. And one of the best ways that you can do that is to subscribe to her YouTube channel, go and follow her on TikTok and Instagram. Like I said, all of that is Kaylin J. Schneider. The bigger we can get her channel to grow, the bigger her platform is going to get, the louder her voice is going to get. And that in turn will start to put even more pressure on the police and she can have answers no matter where that leads, whether, you know, it's John Doe or not. She just deserves to know where her mother is. She does also have a GoFundMe if you, you know, are feeling called to support and donate to that and that is for her to hire her own private investigator to just have some support there and kind of like feel like she has someone who's on her side to help her so if you want to go and check that out i will also leave that in the description below please go send her some love you guys that is it for me today i can't thank you enough for helping me build and grow my channel every single day so that I can bring attention to other creators like Kaylin and raise her up and be a part of this quest for justice for her. Kaylin, if there's anything that you need from us sipping deals, please let us know. Okay, you guys, I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.